Hello, and you're very good, very welcome to today's signpost webinar. Uh, we hope you're keeping safe and well wherever you're joining us from today. Uh, today, we'll be talking about forged wrought iron gates and the historical footprint that these gates have left on our rural landscape, uh, and, and that they are an important part of our heritage, our history, and it's our responsibility, of course, to uh, maintain uh, this legacy that has been left behind uh, by these forged gates. They're now included as an action under the Acres Cooperation Projects in Ireland, and we're delighted to be joined by Shem Caulfield, who is a heritage consultant and artist uh, who has uh, devoted uh, a large part of his life to uh, the, the research into forged gates. And uh, Shem, you're very welcome to today's webinar. Well, thank you so much, Mark. I'm delighted to be here, actually. I'm really delighted, and thanks for the invitation. Yeah. yeah. Great. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank, thank you again. And Pat Murphy, you're going to help us with the, the questions afterwards. So, um, Sean, maybe before we get into your presentation, I'm really looking forward to your presentation. You have lots of uh, fabulous photographs to show us. Um, but maybe could you tell us a bit how, how did what sparked your interest in Forge Gates or how did you get uh, where did you get this interest from? Yeah, um, like I would have lived and worked in a, sort of a rural community, Thomastown, County Kilkenny, worked with farm farmers, if you like, in my young time, younger times, if you like, and have a great interest in landscape uh, and the management of it, the history of it, and uh, trying to listen to it, if you like, from a very early age. That sounds very mystical, but uh, in a very practical uh, way. And I was fortunate enough to be to have met some farmers whom I, I really really admired I um, um, I remember one man uh, James Holden in particular uh, just talking about trees a very old man when I was a young fella and as he talked to me he was uh, rubbing the back of a heifer uh, and talking about uh, how, what the weather is going to be like from reading two different oak trees that were on his land and that you might be saying mystical, magical sort of side of it, but that sort of knowledge and that observation uh, really left, uh, uh, how would you say, something with me. And uh, if I was to say one word, I'm interested in observing. And observing uh, is not just alone about seeing, it's it's really looking. You're nearly feeling it as well as seeing it, of, uh, empathizing with whatever it is you're looking at i don't know if that answers the question Mark. yeah absolutely well i mean isn't it that that's not that knowledge isn't often uh read in books or uh you know and it's it's very local to a particular area so that yeah. that that passing on of knowledge is so so yeah. important um, absolutely. there's something sacred about that if that's not the i don't know what the correct word is but and the feel that if it's passed on to you i've told people about those two oak trees several times uh, mm -hmm. about what the the summer is going to be from which one of those leaf before the other etc etc et and it's like the the carrier on of some message some folklore and so, so everybody that's tuned in today now they will be the carriers on of, of the knowledge <laughs> that uh, we're, we're we're sharing today yeah. Yeah. so so maybe just just uh we could um maybe ask you to to share your slides and before we can get you to present uh, just to remind everybody that uh, today's session is being recorded and will be available on the Chagas website afterwards, uh, as well as a, a, a version as, as a podcast. And you can listen back to the podcast version of the signpost webinar on, on your radio uh, or your, your phones. Um, and do use the Q&A tab at the bottom of the screen. We'd love to get questions. Um, I know, uh, Shem, you have uh, you have lots. Uh, we, you'd love love to, to get lots of questions from, from yeah. the audience this morning. So, Shem, we'll hand over to you, and uh, we, we will chat to you after the presentation. Oh, cheers, Mark, and thanks, thanks a million. And again, thanks to everybody for the opportunity, and, and thanks to Catherine for technical and emotional support for this, <laughs> for, for this podcast. We, we'll bang along because I know we just have limited time. I'm going to sort of make a case for the vernacular forged wrought iron field gate, and I'll explain some of those words um, or develop them, not necessarily explain them. Um, do we, um, I just, geez, um, the old battery is gone in this one. <coughs> oh, here we are. No, there we are. No, it's gone past. Yeah. Right, thanks. Uh, and I'm going to make a case for the vernacular, uh, for our vernacular heritage in general. 
in particular our wrought iron heritage. And the word wrought technically means worked. But I'll be making an argument for uh, what we know as wrought iron or worked iron. It is uh, a particular type of iron, and I'll get to it later on. Wrought iron, the metal, will be number one. Uh, and, sorry, just to go back a small bit. I'll be sorry for the, the, the short uh, podcast that we're doing. I'll be looking at three elements, really. Wrought iron, the metal. Two, the blacksmith's craft, the craft of the local blacksmiths. And three, um, the totems, and I see these as totem, totem poles of our social and political history. And along the way, I'll be illustrating what I, a clatter of beautiful gates from around the country. I was trying to think of a word that describes a number of gates, like a flock or something, and I've come up with clatter, but I'm, go I'm going to copyright that one, okay? <laughs> a clatter of gates. So we move on. Our engagement with landscape, like, it really, really goes... Um, uh, way back since the first peoples came here. But I find it intriguing uh, of men and women setting up homesteads and engaging with uh, the landscape that's that's around them. It's been an intriguing thing for me, uh, how you make a living, how you survive and how you engage. And I suppose the conversation between the homesteader and, it's, and his or her landscape, the things we bring into that landscape, the things we make in it, all of that is... Uh, I find intriguing uh, that sort of endeavor that it's like, um, you know, pioneering uh, the pioneer uh, sort of engagement with it. And in, sorry, uh, in our current sort of situation, we're in, in many ways, we're um, disassociated from weather, from uh, we're, we're living in very cocoon sort of spaces to be out engaging with the real hard landscape and the, or the real soft landscape, the weathers and things that it throws at you. Uh, is to me, um, uh, sorry, an interesting space. I just go through the word vernacular. It's um, this is from the Charter of the Built Vernacular Heritage, and uh, it says the built. You can read it there. Uh, occupies a central place in the affection and pride of all peoples. So when we go to places, other uh, countries, and that that's what we're looking at. Uh, those small things, the style, the gate, the uh, lettering on a shop front. Um, uh, things that are different from our own experience. It says it's utilitarian at the same time possesses interest in beauty. Uh, although it's the work of man, it's the creation over time. And that's an important element in this uh, is the historic and the time element. And it would be unworthy of the heritage of man if care was not taken to conserve these traditional harmonies, which constitute the cores of man's own existence. And the word harmonies there is really, really interesting because it's a harmonic between like be it the the plough the 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 piers the gates the buildings the all of that that um, it's a harmony of a particular time a particular time of endeavour and, and uh, um, how would you say thinking or or idealism or focus I spent a lot of time uh, how would you say surveying and and recording what we call the furniture uh, of the rural landscape and I just threw up a few elements here. We all know this one where water was a communal sort of effort you came and um, and those pumps unfortunately some of them are being lifted and we need to maybe look out for them uh uh tidy them up and a, a bit of paint wouldn't you know it would be grand and down around my side of the world in limestone country we have these lime kilns which are wonderful pieces of construction absolutely wonderful and that whole and i'm sure there's been a lot of research and uh, histories in relation to the works and the, the whole processes there with, with lime. And again, these parts of street furniture, this was a way out in the country, stuck on, at a crossroads. And uh, I know it's from a, um, a bygone era, the ER, the crown. But uh, there are parts, the visual parts, the tactile parts of our uh, sort of um, landscape. And they're important elements. They're like the, the furniture of the landscape. Uh, the built vernacular heritage is important. I've been making the argument for that. It's the expression of our culture and community by, uh, you know, the things that we do and make and of its relationship with its territory. And at the same time, the expression of the world's cultural diversity. When we go to other places, that's what we're looking at. That's what we're trying to tap into is that sort of experience. And um, I'm sorry, I, I, I just lost the word here now in my head. I'll be back to it in a minute. <laughs> and I'm making a case here for uh, uh, the vernacular forge, Rod Iron Gate. It's an important heritage element in our rural landscape. It's an important visual, an important tactile uh, and physical thing. 
Uh, four wrought iron gates are evidence of the changing dynamics in our mining, smelting and forging industry since the 17th century. And not many people know that, that we had a very, very strong uh, mining or smelting industry uh, going back to before the 1700s. Many of these gates that we look at are the product of our own blacksmithing industry there, and they remain, as you well know, in various stages of repair throughout the Irish countryside. And the illustrate what I find really interesting is a, is a, a range of distinctive local gate design and construction. That's not to say if I was dropped in the middle of the country and asked and not know where I was, would I know where I was by the gate design? But I'd make a, a guess if I was dropped into Offaly, Monaghan, uh, Leitrim, uh, parts of Kilkenny, I'd make a good stab at it. You can see styles that are, I won't say county based, but are area based. Um, the third sort of discussion or argument I'd make is these gates stand as sentinels or symbols of our very successful political and, and social struggle from the land from the mid 1850s up. They are totem of they're, they're totem poles, and I would have travelled up the west, sorry, the northwest of America there, uh, up into the uh, Vancouver and that, and into the Haida Indians, and they have totem poles. And these, I would argue, those two piers and that gate are our totem poles. They're telling us if we want to listen to, um, uh, they're telling us a bit about about our history. They're the totems of the land wars. They're concrete expression of the security of tenure that that our farming uh, um, <clears throat> forebears had. And uh, coming down here in the van, I was just thinking about it coming down the hill from Templorum there. Uh, and I'm just thinking about what that might have been like to move from peasant tenant farmers with no security into a space where you could put a wall or a ditch around and put a gate on. Anyway, this heritage asset that I would see uh, is under threat from a number of sources. And I'm trying to create greater awareness around these gates and that uh, look at ways in which we can conserve and, and protect them. Uh, I'm going to bang on now. Um, this is uh, called Ironstone. And as we all, well, around Kilkenny, we know where the coal mines are in Kilkenny, are in Castle Comer. This is what they went mining for initially. Uh, they mined for Ironstone. And that's a very heavy rock in, for its size. And I think it was um, viable in terms of producing iron uh, if it had 40% iron in it. So initially in Castle Comer, that's what they went after. And they found coal, uh, I won't say by accident, but it was the second bit. There's a, there's a, um, a thing called a bloom. And I brought it along in, in the physical world just to show it to you. That's a bit of bog iron. And uh, if you uh, have a look at that there, uh, if you've ever lifted the, the sod in, in a bog and you find that yellow um, uh, clay or lever powdery sort of clay, if you scoop that up and uh, dry it out uh, and make a, a bloomery, a furnace with a bit of limestone and put that in there and burn it away, run off all the impurities, you're left with that. Let's call it a bloom and all the impurities have run off and that is your iron. That's a bit of bog iron made from the bogs of uh, a bog in this country. So uh, mining and smelting and that goes back a long, long way in our country. Wrought iron itself is not mild steel. Uh, and many people say I've got a lovely new wrought iron gate. Wrought means worked, but in, in terms of metal, it's a particular type of metal. Um, I won't go through all the technical stuff there, but uh, there's a, um, a particular process for making wrought iron. It's uh, rolled into a bar, then those bars are cut, they're joined together, heated, rolled again, and cut and roll. And the more times you roll that, uh, the better the iron bar is. And what you get is like a sheet of plywood, you get uh, a layered uh, um, stratified iron. And that gives it its malleability and, and I won't say ductibility, but malleability, and that's what makes it so wonderful, uh, so so beautiful. It's low in carbon, and um, yeah, and it's the preferred method uh, uh, of uh, making iron up into the the, the mid 1700s. The last, um, sorry, uh, the last um, uh, piece of wrought iron that was made was made in the UK in 1974. The last mill closed. The last mill um, smelting uh, process was uh, in Ireland was in, I think, Crevely in County Leitrim. And that closed in about the mid 1800s, 1850s or so. These were all charcoal based, uh, um, how would you say, 
uh, initially charcoal based uh, fuels. So you get oak, make it into charcoal and use that charcoal to create a, um, a heat source to smelt the iron. And if you look at this here, uh, the bit that we have up, uh, a lot of the timber in England had been depleted and some say for, for shipbuilding and they say the same about Ireland as well, that it was used for shipbuilding and stuff. And yes, it was. But the brewing industry in the UK uh, used a lot of timber. Timber was the, the fuel of choice, if you like. Uh, so it became depleted. So they moved over here, a lot of the smelting or, or groups. And you had um, people like Sir Walter Raleigh, uh, the man famous for the spud. He had several uh, smelting industries going from the whole way from Yawn right down into Killarney National Park now. And there's some interesting bits of text about the depletion of the forests uh, down there. So they followed the timber and they burnt the, the um, um, what do you call it, the oak to make uh, charcoal. Uh, one ton of oak was required to create 100 weight of charcoal and 1.7 tons of charcoal were required to produce one ton of iron. Uh, and to produce two tons of wrought iron per day required 600 million. So you can see the impact there. So our smelting industry had a huge impact on, on, on our forests and so. And we were net exporters up to about 1699 of um, uh, wrought iron bar. Can you imagine that? Exporting it. And uh, uh, but then a fella came along and they called Abraham Darby in the 17, um, 1709. And he developed uh, coal, another way of, of creating high heat. He distilled coal to make um, coke. And that coke then, uh, you could say the, the, the 1709, in January 1709, he did the first uh, uh, smelting process using coke. And that was the beginning really of the Industrial Revolution. So you see, in our in our country, then they moved away from timber. All of our smelting industries then moved to the port towns: Dublin, Wicklow, Axel, Aklo, Wexford, all along the coast. So they became big foundries there, who were net importers, uh, because nobody could compete with the new process with um, uh, coke, if you like. Uh, there's a bit about Lee, uh, 1858, and I think. Uh, um, a company called the uh, the uh, O'Reilly Brothers tried a late run at it with coal from Arigna, uh, and but it, it wasn't successful. Uh, so it's not produced. Wrought iron is not produced commercially, and mild steel has become the, the steel of choice for many blacksmiths. And I'd say there's a strong case uh, for having wrought iron declared a heritage metal and given it the status, the status that it deserves, I think, in its uniqueness and the, how it was applied craft-wise into our, into our culture. And it's very, like, uh, I get upset, I suppose, sometimes to see a wrought iron gate going off and being lumped in with other scraps and it's heading off to be melted down when you consider part of the process that, that got it there. So the metal in that uh, um, uh, gate or whatever, the, if it's wrought iron, uh, it's unique uh, and it's not being made anymore. So uh, continue on then. So that was looking at the metal and we're looking at, the wrought iron gate. Now here's a, a lovely gate with two piers, two big, beautiful round piers and a wrought iron gate. Wrought iron gates are particular, and I want to say exclusively particular, are unique to Ireland. You'll find bits of, the, bits of the, uh, sorry, the use of metal gates in parts of Lancashire, Yorkshire, and down into Cornwall in England. But it'll tell you something about our weather patterns or less, certainly our moisture levels. Timber is not, if you've ever put in a decking, you know that you're, you're fighting the elements with decking the whole time in this country. This country, with our moisture content, it's not suitable. That's suitable for exposed timbers. And wrought iron became, and maybe from the availability of wrought iron, but it became the uh, material of choice to make gates. And it is, I know there's no such word as uh, very, or sorry, almost unique, but uh, it is quite particular to this country and very other, very few other places. So that's another thing to remember. Uh, in contrast to Ireland, audits of the United Kingdom farm gates show that the main material used in farm gates construction is wood, was a preference for, uh, um, for metal in, in parts of Cornwall, Yorkshire, and I'd go into Lancashire as well. There's a, a, just a little um, illustration of some of the parts of these gates. Um, 
you have two piers, and normally these were eight, eight to ten feet, and that's part of their sort of problem, particularly in tillage areas now, is that they're too narrow or too small. Um, <clears throat> you can see some of the. Um, <clears throat> I just leave it up there for a little, for a cent for a minute. That would be a typical traditional um, uh, <clears throat> fielded gate. Uh, the bars lower down, you'll notice, are closer together. They're generally referred to as dog bars, used for keeping small animals or lambs in or, or whatever. Or if they're used in a in a yard, uh, used for keeping chickens there and in etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Hung from one side and uh, a latch on the other. And you see a whole range of variations from, uh, from of that style throughout the country. The blacksmith, again, the centrality of the blacksmith uh, is really significant in this country. So now we're moving on to the craft of the blacksmith and the, the significance. Here's one that uh, not 100 miles from me, uh, Jack and Julia O'Gorman, uh, and I think he's putting um, a banding on a tire on a wheel there. And he was a blacksmith that made his uh, uh, living uh, in a, quite a rural place in Raheen de Noor. Uh, that picture was taken in 47. But here is a letter written by him in 47. It's one of a number. And um, he was pleading with the government to get a ticket to buy coal in order that, in another letter, he says that the farmers will have nothing um, uh, uh, to plough with or to harrow with this spring if I don't get coal because uh, they're dependent on me to repair the spring har or pin harrows and stuff like that. So again, the centrality and of the of the blacksmith into rural in rural communities was very very significant, and um, not alone as a meeting place but as a place of engineering and problem solving and, and solution making. There is a forge now, a very old forge from um, down near Innistique. It's in Hatchery Lane in Innistique, and it's from the family uh, Lees. Uh, you can see the bellows there, and uh, some lads taught me that their job used to be to be pulling that lever to blow the bellows to make the fire, and it was an awful job altogether. And uh, I just included a few of these. This uh, friend of mine, Eric uh, O'Neill, he's down in Limerick, and he's running a blacksmithing school down there. And uh, some of the uh, images I'm going to show you now are some of the techniques used in the production or the manufacture of a gate. This one here, you can see the metal is hot and it's a mortise and tenon joint. Okay, that's one of the ways of connecting two bits of material or two pieces of material together. The end of that uh, tenon that's coming out through the, 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 the colder bar there will be flattened off and that will be held at, at right angles there. You can see this one here, uh, putting a twist in it, not alone as a decorative thing, but to change uh, the attitude, if you like, of, of the bar uh, to the hanging style. And rivets. There's another way, uh, homemade rivets, riveting two bits of, of uh, material together. You'll notice there's no introduction of a third element, like we have in arc welding or, or whatever. There's no third element. It's uh, using the material itself to um, to join together. Uh, I say the blacksmith and the forge were central to the economy, uh, said economic productivity of rural communities. And the vernacular forge wrought iron field gate that remains in today's landscape are testimony to this and the changing dynamics in the smelting foundry and blacksmithing industries. Um, I'm just gonna show you a few, uh, a few examples uh, of these. This is a very old style, a very old gate. It's very, very narrow. But you notice two big uh, roundy piers there uh, capped. And um, it's a split gate in the center. It's not hanging from one side. Um, you'll also see that <clears throat> it's a particular style, a horizontal style, with the bars lower down closer together, again, like dog bars, chicken bars, etc., etc. Rounded piers were difficult enough to make, uh, uh, to build. It's easier to build a square one, I'm sure. But if you can imagine you had a horse and cart, and if you remember from your maybe past, that the axle uh, of um, uh, a cart jutted out six to eight inches past the wheel. And if you had a square, uh, a square pier, and you can imagine as you're going through all your horse bolts and that axle gets caught, you either leave the, the pony or the horse on his knees or the axle on the ground. So what happens in a roundy pier is that axle engages with it and it's scraped around, which gives the man or woman driving the cart 
greater, uh, let's say, angles of access to the opening. Uh, for a square one, that's very, very tight. You'd have to be full front on, if you like. So these, as I would say, are testimony to, if you look at it, there's a huge investment here. Uh, a builder has to build those two piers and a blacksmith has to make and hang them. That is a huge investment uh, in terms of infrastructure. And um, I'm just using this as an opportunity to show like the changing sort of dynamics, if you like, in farming, particularly in, in tillage areas where um, uh, wider gate openings are, are necessary. And I give a couple of options uh, further on down the, this, this slideshow to show what we can do with um, wrought iron gates in order to achieve the same, the same thing. Um, here's a gate, quite a beautiful gate. We look at that. Um, yeah, you'll have caught like the unusual uh, opening and closing mechanism there. That primarily was for someone on horseback uh, to open and close that. So you didn't have to dismount. And I think the mounting back up again is a difficult bit, but you didn't have to do it. So you could do it from, from your horse. And that's a beautiful, simple, uh, elegant solution to a particular problem. Um, again, it's in, I, I saw that gate initially um, up near a place called, I think it's Lister Lynn or very close to it. It was in the ditch. And a couple of years later, I went back to photograph to see where, how it was doing and it was gone and I was disappointed. Further up the road, here it is. The farmer had got hold of it, uh, cleaned it up, gave it and primed it. And uh, there it was hanging. And I tell you what, uh, my little heart uh, was very, very happy to see that. And isn't that just a beautiful thing? And the language and the discussion that that the conversation that that has with us about our past and, uh, and our history. Um, people think you know, I'm a bit mad when you talk about something talking to you. But all things that are designed and all things in the landscape, there is a conversation continually occurring. Most of the time outside of our consciousness, but we feel it and we understand or, or sense it in some way. So the conversation with these, these things, these uh, heritage objects are really really important in terms of recalibrating ourselves, but in terms of understanding our history and, and where we've come from, I suppose. This is over near Ross Gray. Now, you said to someone, you're making me a gate, uh, and there, and this is the solution that they come up with there, with those four uh, semicircles. Notice the piers here are not round, but they're set at an angle, and the gate is hanging from the, the, the apex, if you like, of one of those. So again, um, it's inviting um, a whole range of different access points for, for the car. But that's quite a beautiful gate. Here's one not far from me. And this is one of the earliest ones I, I, uh, I'd found. You'll notice the shoulders on the top, the semicircular uh, hoop band there. But if you notice the dog bars in this case are verticals. And that was a solution, vertical spikes to stop animals uh, getting in or out. Um, as the crow flies about half a mile away, this is the, a gate. Obviously, to me, that is the same blacksmith. The shoulders are there again, the flat bar, and uh, the dog bars are verticals. So that style is within a couple of miles. Uh, they're, they're within a mile of each other, I'd say, those two. And you'll notice the two latches, one a pivotal last, latch there that all you have to do is uh, put the weight of your hand on it, and it'll open for you. And uh, the other one, uh, I'll show it to you, maybe a close up there, that pivot latch there uh, for day to day use. And if we're going away to an Oral Ireland, like we're going to go away this weekend, you close the bottom one and put um, uh, a lock in it or something like that. So the Limerick fellas don't come over and steal the sheep when we're away at the Oral Ireland. That's a joke, by the way. Uh, <clears throat> here's another field gate here at the very top. Um, uh, top bar, and you have the two uh, diagonals coming up and the center. Can you imagine, and just looking at that, some fellow was making a gate, and look at the artistry, the craftsmanship, and the beauty that uh, was put into that. There's a close up of that, um, the top end. Uh, there's a man putting something of himself in here, and I presume it's a man, and that's a, a, a presumption in my part. I haven't found too much evidence of, of uh, uh, female blacksmiths. And if anybody has any information on it, I'd really, really love to, to pick up on it. But um, that's somebody, whoever it was that made it, putting something of themselves into what is an ordinary utilitarian uh, piece. 
that's never going to be seen by many. It's just going to keep bullocks in or out. These are some of the markings on hanging styles uh, and uh, finishes. And they're, they're, they're quite, quite beautiful things. Uh, this one is over in the in the west of Ireland now, over near Ballybohan, that one. Got a bit of blue sky. And here is what is a beautiful tapered piece of bar going into a wonderful Fibonacci spiral. Look at the elegance of that. That material is thinning down as it comes back into, into the, the, the focal point on the front. And it's, um, what do you call it? It's, um, uh, what do you call that? Riveted to the, to the top bar. And here is uh, one um, where you often on these gates you'll find makers' names. Not all the time, but you find a mark or a name. And this is from the Lee Forge down near in Estegan County, Kilkenny. And they have a distinctive type of latch. And I'm just showing a, a few images here. Here's one that I'm interested in as well. If you look at the patina on, on that, at the patina of use and the, uh, the movement of that in and out, that bar and, and um, uh, there is an engagement with an object that opens and closes a field. It's designed to keep animals in or out. Uh, and I just think remarkable. I'm gonna talk a little bit about this because this one stirs something in my heart. If you see that circle there, uh, as you know, that latch slides in and out, but underneath the circle is a little, uh, little notch. That notch, as you would have guessed, will be when it slides in past that, that notch drops down. So if an animal is pushing against the gate uh, for long periods, that the gate can't open by itself. But I'd ask you to look slightly underneath that and you see a little indent that travels along uh, the, um, uh, that bar. That is the evidence, the wear of that latch being opened and closed. A man or a woman engaging with this. And there is the documentation, if you like, of the engagement of a, of a human being and the husbandry of the landscape. It is the record, in a way, of that sort of engagement. Wet, dirty, frosty, summery days and nights carrying fodder or whatever it is in, into a field. And there is the evidence of uh, the fact that that occurred. I, up here in Monaghan again, as I say, again, maybe trying to illustrate the variety of different styles there is quite a complex thing. And this is these are farm field gates. That's quite a complex. A lot of work goes into the making of, of a latch like that that has to be uh, forged together in such a manner. And this is of a particular, uh, I'd say I'd identify it as maybe a Monaghan style. I see a lot of it up around there. And here we are now in County Offaly. The guy or the person who, who, who um, uh, developed that uh, gate is an engineer. If you look at it, they're not two two diagonals. Yeah, one is uh, where the angle, sorry, one of them has the two right angles broken at 45. So one is a strut and the other is a support. And look at the triangulation in those. That's a very clever person uh, or, uh, who has an engineering mindset. Look at the center bar that comes up there. Normally that goes up through that flat bar on the top and is a uh, uh, mortise and tenant. But in Offaly, this thing of wrapping around, or it wraps around like an, a hand, wraps around the, the top bar there. And that's distinctive to an area in, in, in County Offaly. Um, again, going back down around my own area here, a distinctive latch, kind of romantic, nearly a heart-shaped thing. Uh, and, and that will tell you again, for me, it would be uh, reminding me of uh, the Lee, uh, the Lee uh, family forge. Again, we'll just go through a few different ones from various parts of the country. This is over in the Burren. And as you can see, initially you see uh, the material is not the same. It's narrower and um, it's thinner. So blacksmiths in the true vernacular sense were using what they could get their hands on. And this is a blacksmith using the materials that are close by and designing their own particular mechanism. You can see how uh, that latch system is, is, is um, again, around the burren, but I draw your attention to this bit. If you look at the two horizontal bars, you'll notice that the rounded edges, they've got, they've got rounded edges. That would indicate that that bar is, uh, was to be used as a, a metal tire on a wooden, uh, a wooden wheel for a cart. And uh, the blacksmith, in his true vernacular sense, is looking around the yard, he has to make a gate for someone, what do I have? 
and they're making it. And you see throughout the country, uh, um, gates made from uh, and with bits of um, what would have been uh, wheel banding or wheel tire. And you notice it because it doesn't have a sharp edge. It rounds off on, on both edges. Uh, these ones, again, County Offbury, and I think there's an association here with railways because that's the, that latch is uh, quite distinctive. Here is uh, Bella having a good look out the gate. Again, that's down towards um, Ballyvaughan, and I'm very, very interested in that devil tail uh, sort of latch finish there. Here's one again over near, um, again, in Clare, this is in County Clare, and look at, the, look at that latch. A beautiful latch and the backup system with the baling twine there as well is really important but the effort gone into making that latch uh, and uh, it's it's beauty it's i don't know i just find it remarkable so that's really this is what we're really talking about this is the standard uh wrought iron uh, gate we've looked at the history uh of uh, smelting in the country we looked at the craft of the local blacksmith blacksmith we've looked at distinctive styles um, and um, here's one now, here's a style. I would say if you were reading that and spend a bit of time looking at it, that man or woman is an engineer. Look at, at the sharpness, the technical sort of, uh, there's a technical quality about this, uh, the notch that he's taken out, out of it. And look, if you go to the very end of the latch, you see that nice little flare out. That is an engineer, that uh, person who made that. Here's our, so there are more organic or, or um, uh, latches. And again, back into the leaf forge, that sort of heart shape, where that piece of metal on the latch is split, tapered down and, and uh, tapped into, into that distinctive style. Here again are some other solutions. And look at the two verticals there and one long cross, uh, diagonal cross. If again, if you look at the dog bars here, there, there's a mixture, there's rounded one, rounded ones, flat and around, really this the distinctive stuff. Gates are used uh, like to open and close spaces. And we see uh, a lot of gates used in all sorts of uh, strange ways. This is, it's great to see it up, but it's lethal. As all of you know, they're very, very heavy. And unless they're hung properly, they're a liability, they'll flatten you. And so I would say when using the gate, uh, a wrought iron gate in particular, it's many, many times more heavier than the, the tubular galvanized fella uh, to hang it right because you'll get fed up of it if you have to be dragging it around the place. So a, a bit of time just to hang it properly and you'll be laughing. And then just a small bit here about uh, repairing wrought iron. Uh, wrought iron is different than mild steel. And in conservation, you, you should use the material uh, that the object was made from uh, to repair it. And I illustrated earlier on, there are just basically three different ways of, of joining um, traditional wrought iron gates together. There's the riveting, there is the forge welding, the, the, the melting of, uh, merging of two pieces of metal together. And there's that um, mortise and tenon. Those are the basic sort of stuff. And there's scarf jointing as well. Electric weld welding on, um, on wrought iron is not great for it. Now, there's a nice finish on it, but it's one of the better finishes. Uh, a man with an angle grinder and a welder is lethal when it comes to wrought iron gates. Chopping a, a bit out and added on, adding on another four feet uh, is not viable. There's a couple of other options here, and I'll show them to you. There's an option now where the wrought iron gate is made. It's still there. And they, the farmer has commissioned this wonderful blacksmith. He wants to extend it by two feet. Or whatever. So they've made out of the mild steel a small gate, yeah, with a little drop pin in the center. So that extends that opening from a 10 foot into a, maybe a 12 foot opening. The integrity of the wrought iron gate is protected. And uh, if you look at the style of the small, uh, of the little gate on the left hand side, it continues the same style as, as the wrought iron. That's a very tasty um, solution to, uh, to a problem. And I'd be advocating. That. And here it is again uh, in that same way and a diagonal put back into, into the small opening there on that. Again, you can use, <clears throat> this is again quite a lovely uh, solution. Again, widening uh, what is an eight or 10 foot gate into a 12 or 14 foot opening. This is just a close up really of the um, uh, 
repairing of what you call the pintle, where the gate hangs and goes into the ground. And in this case, it's a scarf joint. You can see the two of them overlapping and they're uh, riveted together. You can also see face, facing you, you can also see the mortise and tenon uh, coming out. Notice also how that's swelling around that um, uh, tenon that's coming out. That will tell you, and it's one of the ways of, of kind of, I won't say dating a, um, um, a, a piece of a, a, a gate. That'll tell you that was hot punched. That was reddened or heated up and punched through. And therefore you have the spreading, uh, the expanding of the metal around. Uh, nothing has been lost from the metal, it's just expanded around. So if you were to look at it and rub your hand down there, you can see that that, hot, that is hot punched, right? Uh, and if you move on into the coming of electricity and the development of it, uh, more engineered type gates, look at that hole, look at the mortise hole. And if it's a circular one, it means it's a drilled hole. So there was electricity in the workshop at the time. That'd be my theory. Here's another one here. Um, again, um, an, another giant using rivets to, um, to support a break um, in, in the... Um, and we're coming near the end of it now, but <clears throat> I would argue that every object that's designed and made, the seat you're sitting in now, the knife and fork you use, the door handle, everything opens up a conversation with you. Whether you hear that or not is, um, uh, doesn't mean that, that, that it doesn't occur. Um, and it's not to mean, sorry to say that you're hearing voices or things are talking to you, which is a bit iffy, but you're getting feedback from it. Your conscious mind can't take in all that information, so it's an unconscious thing, but it does affect how you feel and how you think. So all these objects, you know what a knife and fork feels good, the door handle feels good, whatever the chair that you're sitting in, all of that. These objects open up a conversation. And I have noticed with the gates, or not noticed my conversations with them, when I spend a bit of time with them, uh, and they tell their story to you. They open up and tell the story if you spend the time with them. I had noticed in an exhibition uh, that I had, oh, just after the Celtic Tiger downturn. If you remember, we lost a run of ourselves in the Celtic Tiger, and then we had that big downturn. I had an exhibition of those photographs, uh, of photographs of that, um, uh, sorry, at that time. And I was amazed at the number of people who, who had emotional sort of reactions to these photographs of Gates. First of all, I thought it was nostalgia, but on, on further inquiry with them, I feel that, uh, sorry, I sense that this, these gates were speaking to those people in an unconscious way of values like integrity, honesty, endeavor, hard work. The values that to a degree we may have and are not being judgmental, lost in the Celtic tiger. So that is the sort of stuff and the recalibration of ourselves through these objects. They are vital uh, uh, to our, uh, well-being, they're vital to our history. And as I said uh, earlier on, they're totem poles. They're telling us about our history and about ourselves. So we have to find ways of minding them and looking at them. Sinead, you're okay. And Gurumila Mahaviv. Sham. That was really a lovely, lovely presentation. And uh, the photographs are amazing. It's it's a I don't I don't think anybody who's tuning in this morning will ever look at a gate uh, the same way again and, and maybe take that time to like you say, have that conversation or allow allow that conversation to yep. to, to wash over you. And uh, I've never quite heard it described that way, but really it, it, it is a good way of, of, of describing it. Um, and huge interest from people. There's, there's some people here uh, volunteering to send you on some photographs of their own gates uh, as well that are, are tuned in today. Yep. Um, and it was lovely to see those more sympathetic repairs uh then then because i actually have a gate myself i'm trying to figure out what 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 does there is no space to, uh small enough to fit it and nor is it wide mm. enough to to uh accommodate the, the modern machinery but um that little add-on can can yeah. and with maybe a drop bolt can can make a, a huge difference um yeah. I mean, I know Catherine uh, mentioned earlier on that it is being uh, these wrought iron gates are being supported in the new scheme, the acre scheme and the, the cooperation areas. Uh, do you think is there enough being done to support that type of restoration work that could could uh, really protect this 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 uh, history? Um, that's a that's a good question. Well, I suppose <clears throat> I would see 
like I've had several uh, meetings and one big one up in Castle Comer. And it's about, a, uh, sorry, awareness raising for me, because I found with a lot of farmers, particularly of a particular generation, they have that grow, if you like, and that knowledge. They, they know something about it. And uh, not that the, the men were crying now after the, um, the talk, but they were quite upset as to what they'd allowed happen to the gate or gates on their farm when they realized the significance of it and uh, the heritage. Now, um, I think that that's the important, and that's what I see myself doing. I'm not telling anybody what to do with their farm or their gates, but I'm just trying to create greater awareness around the significance of these. And uh, I do think the uh, uh, groups like the fact that it's coming into that program there and awareness around that this is something significant and, um, um, and something to be cherished. But the heritage offices around the country, also there are all sorts of people getting on board with this. Like stonewalling is another one, like the art of stonewalling. And some of the farmers that I would have uh, worked with over in the west of Ireland, my God, they they build stone walls totally different than uh, than me down in in my neck of the woods in Norman country, the Norman sort of wall building, and uh, farmers building uh, walls over in the west. Uh, and I spent quite a bit of time over around Ballymahon and, and uh, um, uh, Kinvara and that. So all of these qualities, and I suppose you asked me a question, is there enough being done? There can never be enough done, but uh, but um, we don't want to turn the country into a museum piece, but we do want to keep our totem poles alive and cherish them. They are part of our history, be they stone walls, uh, pier, styles, all of those. It's very easy to drive JCB through it. It's very easy, but it's very difficult to replace and put it back in. Then and so to answer your question, there can never be enough, and that conversation is continual. And yeah, that that's yeah that that's a likening to the totem pole is is a good one, all right, and and that it does tell tell the like there's so much to tell about a time from looking at the gate and and looking at. You know whether materials were plentiful at the time. That repurposing of the the wheel braces and yeah. uh, it's it's extraordinary. Um, <clears throat> huge amount of compliments coming in through the 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 Q and A um, tab here. Um, so if, do please, if you have any questions specifically for uh, Shem, please do do use the Q and A tab this morning. I also took the opportunity there to share with people a link to that Galway uh, Forged Gates uh, project that. Um, that was was run with Galway County Council and a few, uh, number of other partners. It was a very interesting project. I was there for the launch and a uh, <clears throat> huge amount of um, history being shared there and and research completed by Emma Laffey at the, at the time. Um, the the uh, I mean, where where can people find out more information, Shem, beyond that about uh, Forge Gates? Uh, yeah. Um... I have a couple of publications, some stuff up on um, the um, uh, website or YouTube and that if people wanted to have a look there. But, uh, um, something I'd like to put out as well. There is a group called Irish Artists Blacksmiths and you can find them on the um, uh, Internet or the Tinternet. And they'll show you like people, are, blacksmiths who are in that uh, organization, you'll, you'll find blacksmiths that are close by you uh, on, on, on the map. But they would be an important sort of uh, source, uh, Irish artists, blacksmiths. Uh, the Department of Heritage or whatever culture, I'm not sure which department it is, housing, have a lot of uh, publications on the maintenance and upkeep of, of these things. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, and I think there's a. I, I think I met some younger blacksmiths at that event, and they were saying they had done, completed some training. I think down in Limerick, that yeah. there was a course there in Limerick for for yeah. blacksmithing. So something yeah. worth checking out. Pat, some some uh, interesting comments and questions coming through there. You're on mute there, Pat. There's a comment from uh, Donal Sheehan of the the the, the Bride Project, and he's, I think it typifies that a lot of the comments coming in. It says, beautiful, inspired, and eloquent presentation. Real case for including her heritage preservation as part of agri-environmental schemes. And the gates and photos are what draws the eye and makes the landscape attractive. So I think that's that's a typical of, of a lot of, of comments in terms of the, the, the presentation. A few other things. Um, 
few questions about the uh, preservation and and some of the the gates you showed particularly the latter end of the the presentation some of the gates were painted uh, obvious preservation work uh, we had a, a question from somebody in relation uh, who has uh, during lockdown uh, found uh, uh, seven or eight gates on the farm and 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 uh, uh, um, uh, uh, repair them uh, and and try to bring them back. What is the the recommended thing to do to try and preserve them in, into the future? Is it painting them? Is it stripping them back? Or what 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 is recommended there? Well, uh, very good question, and it's a a topic of one um, to paint or not to paint. That is the question. <laughs> uh, uh, first of all, if you look at uh, wrought iron, when it has that uh, that brown, rusty, uh, dusty feel on it. It's 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 fine if that gate is out of water, uh, and not standing in water or wet grass and stuff lying on it where water is going to uh, to lodge. That gate will find it'll outlive the whole lot of us. Um, so that is an oxidization oxidization level. It's that dusty rusty thing. That gate would be fine. But what some people like to do is to keep that uh, uh, keep the gate raw and to rub uh, an oil into it. Some use a vegetable oil. Or there are some uh, moisture inhibitor oils that you can buy in the paint shop and just rub it into it uh, and protect it. I was uh, working on an estate. Uh, I was doing a project up there in, uh, in, in the north of the, the country. And um, uh, I was talking to the, the current owner of it who said that her grandfather used to force them as children to go around all the railings and all the gates on the estate with some oil and a rag and rub down all of the uh, wrought iron uh, on the estate. And that was their job for the summer and they used to hate it. Uh, and that was oiling it and protecting the, 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 the um, uh, what do you call it, the, the, the wrought iron. Uh, lodged water is the biggest, biggest problem uh, for wrought mm. iron. If it's, if it's hanging uh, and out in, in the dry, not lodged in, in muck, it'll survive. So the paint or not the paint. I used to be often, uh, as a young lad, sent out by the mother to paint the gate or whatever it is, and you're using the paint good and thick, and you're ramming it there with a brush, trying to get it into the wrong thing to do altogether. Uh, the proper methodology seemingly is, uh, one, uh, to put on very light layers, put on the primer, but it's light, it's thin, and multi-layer that, and build up then your, your layers. Some like to change the tone if you want to, do, to create a couple of different, just change the tone of it so you see where you've you've got, uh, sorry, where, where you've laid out the paint. Uh, ramming it on like I was doing as a young lad and forced it into places and leaving very lumps and big lumps of thick paint. Seemingly the paint then in the center of that will not dry out completely. So when you get the really warm day, that moisture or material that's in there wants to pop out and it pops out. So what you now have is a receptacle for water and the lodgement of water. So it works against them. So I think that the teaching is uh, light layers, uh, primer, and then just build, build it up. Some people like to use, and I don't want to use a brand name now, but I, I won't, I'll be, uh, but uh, there are moisture inhibitors that one, you can either rub onto the gate itself or two, add to the paint layers uh, that term to, to inhibit uh, moisture. So um, I, I'd say, yeah, I like the raw style myself. Uh, uh, I like uh, the raw style where you can see and feel the, the different marks and, and, and wax on it. Uh, don't galvanize the gate. Please don't. Please. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I beg you not to galvanize. It's, it seems like a great solution. And it'll last forever and ever. But all the marks, all the texture of that gate are lost to galvanization. Um, it quite can, can damage the gate as well. Uh, it can be quite severe uh, under sure. certain of the lighter parts. Uh, yeah. I think the galvanizing. Yeah. You, just oh. a question there. You talked about the artistry and and I suppose the, the, the of the the blacksmith there. But was there an element of I suppose? Social upmanship in terms of the the gates. Did people have uh, very ornate gates as a as a, a demonstration, if you want, of their status in society? Is that something that happened? Uh, well, I can imagine myself that uh, one farmer even showing another farmer uh, without saying anything, 
Uh, look, I put up a, uh, I got a new set of peers in the gate there yesterday, mate. I put them up, and uh, where you can see an obviously huge investment in the gates. It is one of, I don't have to say, yeah, upmanship as well. But it's also, I think, that, uh, and you find some of the fine ones with those peers on them uh, on roadways, and they are statement pieces. And uh, I like to read them as uh, not alone the farmer saying things are going well. I'm investing in this space. And that's, like, as I said earlier on, uh, it's a, a major piece of investment uh, for a gate, a bit of a stick or a bit of wire or whatever, you know, a bedstead would do. It's only a gap. But to invest in this uh, structure is uh, a big investment in the infrastructure of the farm. Uh, it's got to do with husbandry as well. It's got to do with a vision and endeavor. And that's what I like about it. Uh, it's uh, homesteading and it's a, an idea for the future. And the fact after the land wars to say, we're here, this is us. And sorry, I shut up. I, I suppose just one, one question there in relation to, there's a lot of wrought iron, I, I think, maybe they're, they're, they're more modern uh, in, in cottages as well, in, in, in yeah. those front gates of, of cottages. And is that something that any emphasis has been given to? Yeah, well, I picked them up, um, even with that Lee Forge that we spoke about, you might have seen that uh, down at Innesteeg in, uh, in County Kilkenny, uh, I met with Dennis Lee, Lord of mercy on him, he's passed away, but he told me of uh, some of the small gates they'd made for uh, houses around the village. And uh, I went around, he told me where they were, and yes, that was part of, in a village, that they, you know, they got a contract to make a gate for um uh a, a local uh, house owner or or whatever and uh, they made it and hung it you know and put their name on it so it's uh yeah i think that was part of i suppose their their work you know uh particularly if they were in um uh, a more in a villager that sort of stuff yeah, yeah and i suppose it was one of the things that is that the gates give us is is a, a memory of the work of the forges that were there in 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 every village in in, in the country, which have all disappeared and been knocked down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's really interesting um, uh, that you say that. Um, yeah, if you look at the 1840s, whatever map came out there, nearly every crossroads there's a smithy on it, you know, and uh, it was serving a small hinterland uh, um, around it. Uh, and yeah, I would say the focal point, our sort of industrial revolution, our um, thing. But it just it something came up into the head, if I could share it with you. I was at a conference over in uh, Galway many years ago, and uh, there was this, uh, I think it was an anthropological sort of landscape guy, and he was talking about farm buildings and landscape. And he looked at, and again, mapping, and he looked at maps from the 1840s, etc. up. And uh, he was saying, you see a big turn in around 19, from the, the mid 1900s on. And he like, uh, sorry, he uh, drew the connection to the arrival of the pension. Mm -hmm. Tension and note in 1904 or eight, I'm, someone will correct it there. And that meant in farmhouses that Johnny, who might've been in the asylum or Mary in the poor house or someone else staying here, were all dragged home sitting under the fire and they were getting the 10 shillings and for the first time you really had an economy you had a cash economy and you were able to buy services and things and uh, he uh, likened it like the old cyclists when they came over here to cycle and tour around ireland and they went to the farmhouse b and b they brought the tension and note or the or they the fiber to the bottom of the lane it was deep penetration mm. uh, into the countryside in that so there might be uh, lessons here for current economics in terms of the penetration of, uh, of that. But, uh, of, uh, sorry, they, they grabbed everybody they could. You had to be on the 1840 or 41 uh, census and uh, um, uh, to qualify. So there was all sorts of uh, shenanigans, I imagine, going on around it. But okay. that was just interesting in, in terms of, you know, a policy like that and its influence on he said you would find the development of outbuildings and farm buildings uh, really take off after after that. 
Thank you. It's Shem, we are a little over time now, but I'm quite happy to, to, to let it run. And I, I suspect we could have talked for another few hours here about this, given the level of interest uh, from people that are tuned in this morning. Um, and and, and uh, like many of our, our viewers this morning, really grateful for the the eloquent way in which you presented the uh the 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 the, the gates who who could have thought something uh, that's that's right in in front of our noses uh uh i think it's just looking at these things slightly differently and just just like yeah. you say observing the beauty that's there and appreciating it um so shem thank you so much uh some people are inquiring about some of the photos that you've shown that they'd, they'd love to maybe uh see if they could get your permission to to use them so we'll maybe pass on their details to you afterwards and um uh, pass thanks so much for helping out with questions and uh, we're going to be next week we're going to be heading to australia we're going to be listening hearing from professor alison kennedy who's going to be talking about the promotion of farmer health and safety for sustainability in both australia and ireland and we'll also be joined by our own dr john mcnamara uh, who's head and health and safety specialist with chagask uh, shem thanks again uh, for, yeah. for your talk you wanted to make say one more thing i did and i just say like i'm i'm like um i was going to use, use a euphemism there i'm very happy <laughs> <laughs> it's nothing to do with a pig in anything or anything but <laughs> i i really really enjoyed it and i want to say thanks to the whole lot of you and in particular to Catherine for for yes we, we've known each other a little while and i really want to say thank you to Catherine for that and um I, I think, uh, Shem, you're going to have to appoint an agent uh, based on the few inquiries we've had so far. Um, you'll be, you'll, there'll be a few speaker invitations coming through, I suspect. I after that was up there uh, representing some of the RTE guys. I think I'm going to get him. <laughs> <laughs> okay, no okay Shem, we'll leave it at that. Thanks well, so, much, so much, and thanks for everybody for tuning in this morning, and we'll, we'll see you next week. Thanks a lot. Bye.